Hello and welcome along to the Inner Huddle Series 2, Episode 7. This episode is sponsored by SR Health Safety and Engineering Limited and I am joined, as always, by my right-hand man, Jeff Bonner. How are you doing, Jeffrey? Yeah, good, Pez. It's been a while, hasn't it? I, it good has, to be here with you. It has been a while. I was going to say Jeffrey Arthur Bonner then, but I got told off using your full name by Betsy last night. Yeah, time, not so by me. I don't mind. Not by you. Good. So, how are you doing then, Jeff? All good? Yeah, not too bad, Pez. How are you? <laughs> yeah, it's been a um, very, very hectic summer of back-to-back holiday camps. And then, as you can imagine, um, a little bit of time after that to catch up with admin and messages and things. And um, now back into doing... I was going to say what we do best, but I'm not convinced by that. But back to doing the podcast, which um, sort of had to be put on hold for a couple of weeks. We're not too far behind, are we? Not too bad, but you have climbed a mountain in there somewhere as well, haven't you? I did manage to get away and climb Ben Nevis with uh, with the family, which was very nice. Yeah, so had the holiday camps, um, which were full on for all age groups. And then, um, yeah, had a weekend off. Went away, climbed a mountain, and then back to it. How's things, uh, all things Wessex? Yeah, good. We're looking forward to getting our season started. It was supposed to start for us on Sunday, but um, the game was postponed out of our control, so game a week on Sunday, get Loughborough away. Just realised we've still got the rooms set up for three, maybe, or when we had the Zoom call. Um, so I keep having to look over my right shoulder to look at you. It's, um, yeah. Always good planning on my part. Yeah. <laughs> right, shall we crack on with the questions? Um, for those who might be unfamiliar, and goodness knows why you'd be unfamiliar with me, where have you been? But if you are unfamiliar with the podcast, um, this series we've been asking for parents and coaches to send in questions via our social media platforms um, for us to answer quite randomly. In fact, so random, you've had your questions less than an hour Jeffrey. yeah and i've made some extensive notes in that time <laughs> haven't always, I? you've made some extensive notes well i like it when you don't make notes because um it's good to, to bounce off you being uh, just off the cuff freestyling freestyling yes i have actually done a few notes this time and um hopefully it won't sound too scripted so between us hopefully we'll bounce off each other okay right question number one with only a limited amount of time for my child to practice, do you think he is best off practicing his strengths or his weaknesses, Jeffrey? Ah, because you've asked the question, you come straight to me, haven't you? Yes, um, that's how it works. I think I've I've written down. There's no blueprint, mm-hmm. um, and we did do a podcast with John Farnworth on freestyle. Uh, probably a few years back, didn't we? Yeah. And he talked about a flow state that he likes to get into. Um, and that can kind of be training just on the edge of um, what he can and maybe can't always nail 100% of the time. And um, I think that's a really good place to get to as often as you can. And it's quite quite an art and a skill in itself to get into that flow state. Um I think it's called a purple patch of learning sometimes isn't mm-hmm. it I've, I've read that in a book or you you you've probably, probably mentioned book, it yeah, yeah. <laughs> um and you'll know when you're in that flow state because you kind of lose track of time and then suddenly you look up and two hours have flown by um so i think it's great to the practice the things that you can't do as much as you can but it's also quite good for your confidence to re- rehearse and repeat the things that you can do and make sure you can nail it kind of 100% of the time under pressure. Agree. I think the danger with children is they tend to only practice the things they can already do. Um, So you have to keep an eye on that. And to a certain extent, that's great. Um, Strengths might be, or certain strengths might be a child's superpower. Um, It might be the thing that separates them from the rest, maybe not even now, but in the future. Um, And it is good to double down on those things. Sometimes, um, if you, if a child is excelling or anybody is excelling at one particular aspect, you might only need to reach a level of competence in other areas. For example, if you're a magician with 
your right foot. You might only need to practice to get your left foot to a competent level because your right foot's genius. Um, but having said that, there definitely has to be a balance between the two. I, I guess with this question is they're asking what to do if you haven't got that balance. Where does your focus go? As, I mean, I suppose you could alternate weeks of when you're practicing on, on weaknesses and strengths. I mean, I, I I did write about it in my book, Jeff, as you can imagine. Um, and I, I had a little look at it and I picked up this quote um, that's in the book. It says, if you're Wonder Woman, then be Wonder Woman. Don't try to be Aquaman. So <laughs> it, it made, made, me, made me chuckle when I read it. Um, I don't think it was one of mine. I think I lifted it from somewhere. Um, but I like that. So, yeah, if you if you do excel in some area, if you're an attacking player and your strengths are dribbling and um, maybe creating chances, then, OK, perhaps you're not going to spend hours improving your heading ability and your tackling or jockeying. So I, I, can't, I do understand... Training your strengths is important, but not to the detriment of not becoming competent in, in other areas. And as I've said, the danger with children is that if they only practice things that they're already good at, then obviously they're missing out on a lot of potential there and they're in danger of developing a fixed mindset. And we see it a lot where children will only practice in sessions what they're already good at. Um, is this it? Is this it? And they know it's all, you know, they come up to you, don't they? And say, is this it? And they know it is, and they just want the praise. But then when you give them a challenge, they sort of disappear a little bit because they don't want to be seen as not being able to do that. Whereas you want them to try things, make loads of mistakes, explore, explore all the possibilities and work out what they can and can't do or what, um, what they like and what they don't like and, and explore it all. And, and learn through trial and error yeah and then on the flip side of that as well I would just be very very careful of always pointing out um, the weaknesses so it can become a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy can't it if a family sat around the table going oh you, you just never do anything you don't tackle you don't you never win the ball back for your team and the more you, you, you I'm just trying to put Betsy's hat on there and yeah. think about the psychology of it um, so are the weaknesses that big a deal that you need to actually be pointing them out all the time or can you just wait for the child to work out that's an area that they want to go and work on because it'll be much more powerful if, if they want to actually go and improve an area than a parent or a coach or a friend harping on about it over and over yeah I agree um I mean, an obvious one would be to improve. If you've got a, a, a strong foot and a weak foot, then a child really should be trying to improve their weak foot. But again, maybe only to get to a competent level, um, so not to the detriment of practising things that they are really strong at. It's just, it's, I thought it was an, an easier opening question here, Jeff, but yeah. it's actually it's, uh, it's quite a tricky one. And I think the problem is, Jeff, that there's so much football out there now there's teams, you know, your traditional leagues, your elite leagues, you've got franchises, soccer schools, shadow squads, foundations, development things, you know, the list is endless. Um, and if your child's into football, the chances are they're going to be going to a few of those different things, which doesn't often leave a lot of time for them to practice on their own or at home. Um, just through time constraints or energy levels um, or opportunity. So if you do get that opportunity, I understand the question, what they, they best concentrating on. And I, I don't know, I always feel bad when I say getting a balance right between the two, which is what I've written here, is a little bit of a get out of jail free card, isn't it? Yeah, but it's it's also important, isn't it, just to not just be constantly hammering somebody for their weaknesses and trying to improve, improve, improve when... Mm you do get confidence from maintaining and rehearsing the things that you know and improving the things that you're already quite good at yeah i mean in short definitely don't ignore either um if you don't practice either then neither of them are going to improve um but like i say if if they're particularly good in one area and that's what separate them from the others don't think oh i'm 
super brilliant at this or my child's super brilliant at this they don't need to practice that anymore um they still do um especially if you know they want to keep at that level and and excel in cool it's yeah. easy to get rusty as well isn't it i've just had a month off really and my feet feel slower than my brain <laughs> which is pretty slow <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty slow at the best of time cool um question number two yeah why not do you want to fire away with that yeah in a previous episode you talked about the power of visualization can you explain more i'm gonna look at you pez you're gonna look at me because yeah. you asked the question um we've done quite a bit on visualization before um and it's a good one for when Betsy's around. And if you're not a regular listener, we have um, our, uh, what do you call it, in-house? What's, I can't think of the word. Psychologist. Psychologist, sports psychologist. yeah, sports psychologist. But she's our, our mainstay, our regular. Um, she can't make this um, the one this week, unfortunately, but she'll be back next week. But I thought we'd keep this one on it anyway, Jeff, so that we can have a, a little bit of a pop at it. Um, I'm massive into visualisation. I use it. As a coach, I've used it as a player. One player in particular that used to use it a lot was Wayne Rooney. Um, I think he's been uh, quite vocal in how it helped him. Um, and the science behind it, I've written here, is the brain cannot decipher what is real and what isn't real. Um, and it's beneficial, beneficial. It is as beneficial as practicing for real in terms of say you're visualizing taking a player on or taking a penalty or, or anything it actually fires up the same part of your brain muscles and neurological pathways as if you were actually doing it so it can improve a lot of areas in your development by visualization i actually think it's best for um building your confidence especially if if you're nervous about a game so it can be really good for performance anxiety if your child or you as an individual are um, always thinking of what negative things might happen you can actually visualize things going really really well for you in a match and in, in as much detail as possible Rooney used to think about what things felt like and what the smell would be like and how he'd be feeling in a certain situation um, you know what the floodlights were like as much detail as, as possible and he would put himself in these scenarios and and then imagine himself executing it perfectly and how he would do it and how he would feel before it and after it i also think it's important to visualize when it doesn't go right and then to to quote a betsy phrase what, what's the win what's important now and how then how you're going to get out of it visualize yourself what you do next in that situation so you've then got a coping strategy if things do go badly which then prepares you for, for both scenarios when it comes to it in a match but you asked jeff you know yeah well, you <laughs> covered it brilliantly Pez. that's um well i wrote some notes which is great because it means i don't miss anything but it does sound a bit scripted so i'll try and as always get the balance right between the two our old friend balance again yeah my, my very brief notes were pretty similar um, same physiological response um, so the electrical impulses fire down to your muscles exactly the same way as if you're actually enacting out the practice um, I think it's quite if if you've got a child that is in a session where there's lots of cues and you're standing around a lot I think that's a really good opportunity to practice some visualisation um, maybe you might have to receive the ball and beat a player to get your shot off once you've got to the front of the queue um, and that's a good time to maybe visualise what the defender's body shape will be like and are you going to do a re reverse flip-flap if it's facing one way or a flip-flap if it's going the other way and have a couple of things in the locker that you've practised and rehearsed in your in your brain. Um, and then the way that you practise it is really important as well. So um, you can either imagine yourself as if you're watching yourself on TV from outside your body or you can mm -hmm. imagine yourself from your own eyes and that perspective um, and I think that there's very similar results from both but I think it's slightly more powerful if you do it from within your own body okay. and get that detail and that you talked about Wayne Rooney with the feel of maybe the grass or the sports or the floor 
um, um, what it feels like to receive it on the inside of your foot or the, the sole of your foot and, and all that kind of stuff. So the more detail that's in there and the more real it is, um, the better it turns. Yeah, and it is very, very powerful. Um, it sounds a bit... We were, we were, whatever yeah, wishy -washy wishy -washy yeah. would be a better one, doesn't yeah. it? But it, it is very powerful. It's why I threw Wayne Rooney in because it worked for him. It's worked for loads of other players as well. Um, and it can work for your child, undoubtedly. So if they're worried about something or some area of their game or they just want a confidence boost for the match tomorrow, so before they go to bed the night before, just get them to visualise them playing in the game and seeing what happens and how they're developing and through how the game's developing. I used to do it. I used to pretend I was stuck in midfield and I was everyone was giving me the ball and I was laying it off one and two touch or 40 yard pingers and captain's armband on and you know dominating the game and you know, build my confidence up um, and visualize scenarios that I might be getting into the next day. It's got to be why when an athlete kind of sleeps, eats, breathes of sport, this is what they're doing all the time, aren't they? They're, you know, you hear about Maradona taking his ball to bed with him or something like that. Or a, yeah, so the one percents. Yeah, I mean, it might just be a one percent. They're just constantly thinking about it. So well, these these pathways are always firing all the time. So yeah. even almost when they're sleeping, they're practicing. Yeah, absolutely. And and any coaches, I think I said this last time with the question. I find it very powerful if a session's a bit flat, especially when I'm working with the ball each of the players to actually, and I've done it quite a lot, I sit them all down and they get a few giggles and stuff to start with. But once you get over that, it's very powerful. You get them to close their eyes um, and I actually do it two ways. One, I get them to visualise how their favourite player would be practising whatever we're practising. So I say, think how they're moving, think how they look with the ball, they've got their heads up, are they looking like they're keen, are they, what's the tempo like, etc, etc, whatever I'm trying to get into them. So I let them do that um, for a while. Or, and I can do both, I ask them to visualise um, the best version that they've ever been. So um, when, they have, when they had their best ever game or their best ever training session, how they felt, and imagine that they're that best version now and, and how did you feel then and how did you move and um, what was sort of what was your attitude to it then and then you get them to open their eyes and go right now be that player to so either themselves or the, their favourite player and honestly the, the session just goes through the roof it's amazing isn't it because that is a relatively simple thing to do you're not having to demo anything you're not having to show a pattern of play or something complicated you just go in, use the power of your imagination, and off you go. Is there anything more powerful than the imagination? Who knows? I think that there is, mate. Cool. Right, well, question three already, Jeff. What are your top tips for parents that have young children just starting playing football? Cool. I've got a book coming out that, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's um, very, very large, um, but we'll try and do it justice. In... So your top tip is get the book when it comes out. Oh, yeah. Hopefully it'll be out later this year, depending on when you're listening to this podcast. Um, so don't worry, I'll let everybody know, Jeff. My extensive note says, play, 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 ball, ball, ball. Um, and I think yeah, should we move on? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's as, as simple as that for me. Um yeah, so all, all about the ball um, from you know a very early age. Um, and we're going to get on to a quote that Wenger says in the next question, so you know, it'll tie in nicely with that. But from a young age, technical skills, which is what Wenger's called it, but techniques working with the ball, as Jeff's just said, ball, ball, ball. Um, because there is a golden age when they're young, um, when the neurological pathways are developing and you can lay down the scientific term myelin across those pathways which then reinforces those otherwise known as muscle memory but I don't think scientists like that expression but yes muscle memory to us so the more they can do with the ball literally the better footballers they will be when they're older um, don't worry about tactics ball 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 thanks Jeff we'll, we'll need a t-shirt with that on ball 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 um, in terms of a team Obviously, somewhere that they're safe, 
having fun and definitely learning new skills. Um, like I say, not, not about tactics. Um, and I've put here, not a team that puts pressure on children with an overemphasis on winning and recruitment. It should be about developing what they've got in that team and, and having fun. And if you are looking for a team, you can't go wrong with a nice little village team run by nice people that really look after the kids and do stuff in the evenings with them and at the weekends and where there's nice friendship groups to be made and that the kids don't feel like if they don't win at the weekend or don't play well, they might recruit someone from some other team to take their place. It's just a shocking environment for children to develop as footballers and as people. So having fun, safe, learning new stuff and don't worry about winning. Yeah, I mean that that point about the winning and the, we've been to loads of tournaments with very young teams at times and there'll always be like one super team and all the parents are walking around going, oh, they're really well drilled, they're really well drilled. But mm -hmm. like, I'd rather take a group of individuals that love the ball and express themselves and try things and maybe don't win that tournament for the next 10 years as my team than the team that's been really well drilled. And probably if they are recruiting and it's probably got a 12 to 18 month shelf life and then it'll be a completely new look team Yeah. in that period. And with kids your child released. might not even be there or it won't be their mates that they will start out with in the first place. So Yeah, or your yeah. child might just say, this isn't fun anymore yeah and, and and want to quit the game so it is it is very important I, going back to your point i think you need to make the choice whether you like that style of glory team and possibly winning which is very short-term success so you might get a lot of adulation praise nice feelings social media posts etc etc but that is at the detriment to the long-term development normally. And therein lies the problem because everyone likes that, don't they? Yeah, They're we all do. They like I liked it when I was a kid and I, I, yeah. I like it with my son. You know, I, I understand it and I get it, but you have to be aware that probably these well-drilled teams, and not all of them because it is possible to do both, but a well-drilled team that knows the tactics and where everyone is on a pitch and where they should be and combining probably is to the detriment of their technical individual technical development which is what they're going to really need if they want to play at the highest level or simply just fulfill their potential and we all know where we should stand and what to do when we get older don't we go into any pub when england are playing and you'll hear everyone shouting out <laughs> should do this should do that we're all experts we know we know a defensive line and all the jargons of playing through the lines and dropping deep and the press and counter press and we know it all but the reason we're in the pub watching the football and not on the tv playing the game at that level is because we're not good enough technically with the ball so you going back again sitting on the fence a bit you have to get the balance right you have to learn the game but also learn your your tool of the trade which is the ball and how to move as well and there's so much goes into it yeah, that's got quite deep for a question. Yeah, it has got quite deep, has not it? Just starting to play football. I just couldn't but... imagine that yeah. the, the person that sent that in now started scribbling some notes and then just frying the pen and going, oh, it's, it's a bit too deep. I just wanted to know where it's going to play tennis. Take... Yeah, it's going to play tennis. So <laughs> apologies for that, but it's something that we are very passionate about, isn't it, Jeff? And yeah. Getting that bit right. And well, we've seen so many children with potential get it spoiled. Um, by the wrong choice of team which on the outside looks like a good choice of team because they're winning things and they're well drilled and the training might look good but there's not enough contact time with the the children and the actual ball and there's not enough mistakes being made because these places tend to be a mistake free culture which means their um, learning is actually being capped and stifled um, and they're not going to go on to fulfil their potential. Although they might win a few tin pots and a few medals along the way, so it might be enough for everybody. I don't know. It's can confirm your choice. a bias short term, can't it? Rather than 
looking at the long term project, or the long I shouldn't call it a project, no, but the long term development. Yeah, of, of the child. Yeah, it depends what you want. Do you want your child to be sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, and and the best player they could possibly be, or do you want them to be, you know, maybe quit by then, or playing very low league level football. Um, but they had a few experiences of winning some trophies as a kid. I mean, that's that's what you're deciding, really, isn't it? By where well, you're taking your child to play, you're getting even deeper. Yeah, I know I what I choose every time. Hmm? I know what I would choose every time. That's not yeah, it does all boil back to somewhere safe, where having fun, learning new skills, and making friends. And I know there'll be people there that go, "I want more than that for my child." I've been told they're really, really good, but honestly, everything needs that foundation. Um, whether they're going to be the next Wayne Rooney or just play local football um, those things will hold them in the best stead possible goodness Oof, I think I need a drink after that I don't mean this water <laughs> right who's asking what now Jeff I'm on question number four you're on question number four go on then hit me with it I saw a quote from Arsene Wenger about technical skills that you sent out. I'm guessing that's on social media, Paz. Yeah, that's, this is directed at me, yeah. Please, could you elaborate more on the subject? Okay. Well, I came across a quote and from Arsene Wenger, and then I looked more deeply into it, and it was actually part of a, a live Q&A thing that he'd done. Um, with the guy who does talk sport now, I can't remember his name. But um, so I, I listened to a little bit more than just the quote. But basically, the quote is this He said, If you have no technical skill at 14, you can forget it. You will never be a football player. Okay. Um, so I would just sent that out to, as part of a wider email but I did include it in there just to reiterate re-emphasize the importance of technical ball work and ball mastery because our topic at the moment is what we call core skills and ball mastery and sometimes we call it brain gym and footwork and fast feet and all sorts of other things but it's basically ball mastery isn't it a movement mastery so I use this just to emphasise the importance. Um, quite simply, Jeff, I mean, a lot of parents that listen to this want their children to go on and have an eye on them maybe being a professional or getting into an academy. And let's have it right, they do. You know, my son's heavily into his boxing and I can't help myself. I think, well, if he wins a few fights and he does really well, you never know where it's going to end up. You can't help yourself as a parent. You do it and it's natural and I get it. So it's our job to be real about these things and to, to help those dreams. And children should have dreams. There's no reason why they shouldn't. But only 0.0012% of children that play football go on to be professional players. That is the statistic. Isn't that the stat for kids that are already at an academy that go on to play? I think that might be 0.0017%, <laughs> okay. but it's all very, very close. <laughs> Um, so yes, it could be even less, really. It's quite generalised, but I think we'll agree it's less than 1%, um, less than half percent, and it's very, very low. Um, so what Wenger's basically saying is, if your child's not doing any skill, technical skill development training, they've got no chance, absolutely no chance. So if you want that 0.0012 to maybe go up to 1% or a 2% chance or higher, your child is going to have to get very good with the ball. And that's nothing to do with what we've, you know, like we said previously, it's nothing to do with where to stand on a pitch and how to be, beat an offside trap and where you should be running when your left back's got the ball or whatever tactics might be. It is how competent are you with the foundations of football, passing the ball, receiving the ball, um, skill, how do you make a yard for yourself, um, the list can go on and on and on, but ball mastery, being a master of the ball, and if you're not a master of the ball, and I know there's been players who haven't been, like Stuart Pearce and things like that in the past, but even they had a... Um, 
the basics to a very, very elite level of what they did, passing and receiving, basically. And obviously, Piercy like to tackle, but you know, would Piercy survive in the modern game now with it being so quick and fast? I don't know. But the more competent you are with the ball, the the quicker you can play the game at, and the quicker you can play the game at, the higher the level you can play at. It's dead simple. So, unfortunately, if your child's in a team or teams where technical skill development and ball mastery and movement mastery and individual work is ignored, I'm not ignored, I don't like saying that, but dismissed. Dism not even dismissed, it's probably even worse. I don't want to say like it's done on purpose, but there might yeah, not be okay. enough time. Um, but if there's not enough time for that work, your child will not go on to fulfill their potential. And even if people can say, well, it worked for my child and they became a player at this level, then they probably could have played one or two levels above that. So if they played in League 1, they probably could have played in the Championship or the Premier League or for their country. And if they played for the country, they could have gone on maybe to have been, you know, a Messi or Ronaldo. Who knows? There's always levels you can can go up um, and ball mastery is undoubtedly and movement mastery because kids need to learn how to move with the ball um, is undoubtedly the foundations give you the, them the biggest platform possible to, to go on and achieve I don't like going on about pro cars but achieve and fulfil their potential um, and give them a chance at any dream that they, they might have at, at least um, but I get it. If a team is under pressure, which most teams are nowadays, by the way, they're under pressure to win a game at the weekend, their training all becomes about what happened in the last game, what did we do, what didn't we do, and what are we going to do in the next game. So the focus becomes very, very narrowed for team training. It's all about the last game and the next game and how they're going to put things right or how they're going to... Um, build on what they might have done already that's positive and how are they going to win their next game and that might change depending on the opposition who's available lots of different factors might come into it but it's still a very narrow window last game next game what we're going to do about that now and there's just not enough time to um to work on players individual weaknesses and strengths it's it's all about the team and organizing the team and if that's the case, your child will not honestly fulfill their potential unless they can get that from somewhere else, the individual stuff, or practice on their own. It might sound a bit harsh. There might be a few people that don't like that because their child might be nearing 40 now and think, well, we've never done it. But it's never too late. You can always improve, especially when you're still young. Um, well, any age. I started when I was quite old with the ball mastery and it certainly improved my game and got me to the next level it's gone deep again haven't we Jeff yeah and I think Wenger's really talking about when he says you'll never be a footballer or whatever the quote was um, he's really meaning in Premier League and international players isn't he so yes yeah yeah I mean I didn't start doing any ball mastery until I was in my mid 20s I don't think yeah and I was the same but it's one of the reasons I do what I do because I think if only. Yeah, but you can still make a massive difference to your movement mastery, your quick feet. There's so much you can do, even at a later stage, isn't there? Well, look at Ronaldo. Mm. Probably still practices his ball mastery. He certainly was at Manchester United and Real Madrid, um, from what I understand. Um, they're constantly, constantly looking to improve. It's a bit like boxing training. I like my boxing analogies. Um, and I, like, I try to use the analogy with the kids as well, whereas a lot of boxers will do things like skipping training. So I'll say to the children, you never see a boxer in a professional fight with a skipping rope in the ring. It's not part of the game, but they do it because it helps them. It helps them to stay up on their toes, gives them rhythm, um, you know, bouncing on the soles of their feet. I mean, I'm not a boxing expert, but it's it's all to do with movement, um, being able to um, adapt quickly because you're up on your toes 
we need to, we need to get a specialist boxing coach in really but they do it to help them improve um an aspect of their their game so that when they get in the ring they're a better boxer so some of the ball mastery might not look like um, it's something you would use in a game but it is helping an as aspect it might be quickening up your feet firing up neurological pathways getting your body used to using both feet getting your body used to shifting its weight quickly from one side to the other and back again which is very very important for most sports um, and that will then in turn help them move better build their confidence give them touches of the ball and that will help them be a better footballer even if they're not actually using that thing in a match does that make sense jeff i don't know if i've explained that very well it does to me but yeah we, it's a, we talk it's about it trouble, all the time, we? yeah we, we we um we're in it and we've been in it for for a long time but i do like the boxing analogies the, they do the speed bag they do heavy bag they do pads um they freestyle so they shadow box they do a lot of kind of the same theories as we do and i know people might be going well that's an individual sport well you know hold the front page but the expression is football's an individual sport as well i don't care what anyone says um it's a team sport in the fact that those individuals are combining together to try and win a game of football um but it is an individual sport in terms of the better are as you are as an individual the more likely you are to help your team and the higher level that you are going to end up playing at one day have i gone too deep deep jeff i don't like to upset people yeah but whatever level you end up at as well i always enjoyed playing in a team that had the ball more than the opposition yeah so if you're made up or whatever level of a group of players that aren't technically very good then you're not going to enjoy your game as much because you're going to have less of the ball and you're going to be spending it Running. Making recovery <laughs> runs and chasing shadows, aren't you? I'd rather be in a team that's got the ball more than the opposition. So Yeah, and it's it's not about learning flip-flaps and things like that. I think Jamie Redknapp came out with something live on Sky the other day about... Um, he called a flip-flap a flip-flap. He did call the flip-flap a flip-flap. But his point was a lot of coaches are teaching the flip-flap mm -hmm. um, when they should be teaching players desire and um, commitment and things like that. Um, and he's right They're, that is a massive part of the game because children won't get to a level unless they've got a desire um, but teaching a flip flap and things like that um, I'm going to go off piste a bit here but it's um, you have to teach them something don't you you have to engage them with something so that they can get contact time with the ball and you have to let them express themselves so you might do flip flaps and things but I don't care if any child I have ever taught the flip-flap to never, ever, ever uses it in a match. Because it's not about that. It's a bit like I've just said with a, a boxer practicing on a speed bag. He's not going to stand there and try and do the speed bag motion against someone's face in a, in a boxing fight. But they practice it because it increases their hand speed and their movement and their confidence, etc., 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 and so on. Um, so we do teach the flip flap and things like that but not just so that it's used in a match i was going to go somewhere with that and i've forgotten but anyway as soon as i mentioned jane redknapp i diverted <laughs> <laughs> but anyway we have gone really really deep on that should we leave it there yeah it's something that we're both very passionate about isn't it so technical skills and ball mastery and well it's what we do yeah we decided that that's the route we would take because we were passionate about it so that's what we teach and what we do dare I say it, where our expertise lies. So, bound to go a bit deep, aren't we? Cool. I hope that's answered the poor person's question. <laughs> uh, I've lost now. Is it me? I don't mind reading it, as you've just done a lot of, a lot of waffling. <laughs> you did do a lot of waffling. You can see how I wrote a book. Question number five. Go on. My son plays for his local team and used to really enjoy it. A lot of the players from his team now play for a Saturday team as well. And they have started to make fun of my son for not being good enough as they are all now in the academy. Can you offer us, his parents, any advice to help him? We're new to football and don't fully understand the differences 
in the teams and how to explain things to him. Beautifully read. Thanks, mate. As, as soon as it's more than like one sentence, you normally struggle a little bit. Well done, Jeff. Yeah, well, it's a big old paragraph, that. Thanks, mate. Yeah. Um, I can see this situation happening a lot um, with the emergence of these elite leagues, particularly on a, on a Saturday, and the kind of established village teams on a Saturdays uh, on a Sundays are now losing a lot of their players or not losing but their players are then going to play on a Saturday as well that tends to be the scenario Jeff and that's what I think of when I I uh, listen to this question um, so it looks like some of the players in their team have now playing on a Saturday um, and then making fun of the child that's not gone with them as if they've um, sort of gone up a level to some extent um, and it must be a nightmare for parents at the best of times but an even more of a nightmare for parents if football's not your thing and you've just taken them along somewhere because your child likes playing football and you put them into a team and you think oh this is all very nice and everything's going well and then suddenly you're presented with this sort of problem and it's beyond your knowledge um, so firstly, I'll say these children will not be at a professional academy. That's the first thing. Um, they might not know that because there's a lot of stuff out there. Um, so professional clubs will have things like foundations. You know, Chelsea have got a Chelsea foundation. Southampton have got Southampton foundation in in our area, and these aren't the academy. There's lots of grassroots things out there that are branded as elite, isn't there? And it's must be very confusing. Yeah, and some are Brandon's Academy, and I'm guilty of this myself. I call my invitational group, what I used to call my advanced group, um, I call that an academy. And I've, I've done that for many reasons, but one, to make it obvious to everyone that it's a level above the open sessions. Two, because I felt like I had to, to keep up with other places that were randomly calling their things academy and it the word is synonymous is that the right word jeff with yeah with football so people know when they see the word academy or should know that it's a level above maybe what other stuff you're doing it's quite difficult i was going to say level above grassroots but it's not because it's all grassroots it's all grassroots um the junior premier league is grassroots football. Um, the foundation stuff and the pro clubs is all grassroots football. Um, people might portray it out to be different levels of grassroots football and I've heard the expression bridging the gap between grassroots and professional football but it's still all grassroots so for your child to be teased that they're not at an academy well these children aren't either um, or they wouldn't be allowed to still be playing in the team. Chances are they've gone to join a team that play in a, a, a supposed elite league of some sort um, and because your child hasn't, is uh, is getting on them a little bit. And I think you have to go and speak to the coaches really and let them know what's happening because it is a form of bullying whether it's grassroots academy or the national team. It's not right. Yeah, I, I wish people that had set up elite leagues at grassroots level or elite teams at grassroots level um, would maybe consider this byproduct of what they've done and this feeling of this child I don't think is unique to this child I think it's happening oh no I see it a lot uh, yeah all over the place a lot now because well I don't want to sound like an old so and so but when I was young <laughs> we played Sunday morning football as a child and that was it and you trained with your team once a week they were your mates that was your bond your connection yeah. and if someone moved a team it might be because they've moved areas or they got more friends in another team but it was pretty much you played with your team from under nines all the way through to under 16s yeah and they were your mates what yeah. you did it was your identity as well a little bit of your club you played for 100% and... it was part of who you were especially if it's connected to a village and it was your village yeah. you know it, 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 it's such a lovely thing but 
the game's changed and it's not like that anymore and it is a minefield for parents and what it's done is it's you know the, the parents of these child of this child and other children might then go well I've got to get my child into one of these academies elite centers you know for the for the benefit of my child um not in this instance I'm sure but it can be for parents egos or whatever it might be or just that the grass is greener somewhere else or a fear of missing out and then suddenly these children that you know haven't been involved there's a rat race to get them involved um and I've seen it with the junior premier league locally it used to be that the JPL only had one team within a set radius now I don't know how many clubs Jeff but most clubs in the area now got a team in the in the JPL um and so it's become a little bit of a a rat race and to win games um because if if a team's in in that league and they're not winning games then players are going to leave because there's um different options out there now um so football local to us and I'm sure it happens in other areas has become very much now about results and recruitment and sadly development and not just even developing kids to get to a certain level and stuff like that that we go on about on being professionals and things but nice things like that bond with your village that bond with your friends your teammates from school whatever it might be it's slowly dying out isn't it yeah I, I, my notes my extensive notes i've written <laughs> down it's not where you are now but how much you enjoy the road to where you're heading so um but you're not going to enjoy that road to where you're heading if people are making fun of you are you so i, I really hope that there's a solution to this because it's, yeah, it's and, horrible and, isn't it you know what tends to happen in this solution is two or three of the players have gone to a saturday team to help an adult win a game of football that's i'm going to put it bluntly um <clears throat> and to help the other adults win a game of football that are watching because because they want to win um and this poor kid's kind of been left behind but it might be that those kids that have been um then gone to saturday team are only going to help that team win because they're a lot older than the child they might might be born september september and the and the child that's been left behind smaller less um um, developed because they're almost a year younger in the age group might be something like that but the kid that's been left behind might have the most potential um, and that poor child now might go well I'm not good enough no one wants me to play in their elite team on a Saturday um, I'm not good enough I'm going to go and find something else to do that I might be good at and the amount of potential that's being lost out there now is frightening so my advice is keep your child there where they enjoy it speak to the coaches because we don't want any sort of bullying or anyone feeling um low or disappointed or, or sad especially with kids football um and try not to get caught up in the rat race of thinking that you have to follow them either there or somewhere else um just to be good because you don't it feels like it's the next big project isn't it because there's so much that has improved about grassroots football from when i was oh massive that yeah, age. Like... we used to play 11 aside on a men's pitch and men's goals yeah. from under nines and now it's small sided football up to different age bands and stuff isn't it and yeah. but this is like the one thing that i feel like has gone backwards um, and needs to be resolved really kids shouldn't be feeling left out of elite teams at grassroots football and being left behind and feeling like this poor child um, yeah and it's happening at six seven eight nine years of age yeah it's not like when they're at secondary school and they might have to learn to deal with a bit of disappointment and you know, yeah, and it was, levels are found, and it wasn't always perfect back in the day. You probably had three subs that never got on the pitch, and you travelled <laughs> yeah, yeah. around, and that, that's things horrible. have that's improved just as horrible, massively. Isn't it? And um, equal playing time. I hope in ten to twenty years' time, we'll look back at this period and go, "What were we doing?" You know, I'm glad that it's been sorted now. How it gets sorted, I don't know. It might be that there's um, categorisation from the FA um, about what the standard is um, and to meet those standards they'll have to have a certain level of coach 
a certain type of coaching. Um, I can't think of other bits off the top of my head, but so maybe certain facilities, um, pathways, whatever it might be, a pathway to a first team and you know an adults team or senior football, and they can categorise what yeah, these clubs are. Because I, I could set up a club tomorrow, get them entered into a league, advertise that I'm doing, you know, or we're doing the. The hosts of the podcast, the United podcast, are setting up a, a glory team, and we want all the best players from the area to come and join us. And we're we're going to enter this elite league, and we're going to give it a real go. And there's going to be opportunities to progress to pro level, and blah blah things we see all the time. We could do it, and there's no governance of that whatsoever beyond being registered to the FA and having DPS checks and things like that, which again is a massive improvement in the game that's happened since I was a child but still there's no government governance on what people are saying and what they're categorizing their club or team or project as in a club you should feel like you belong and you should feel safe there shouldn't you you should feel like I'm not even talking about football necessarily here I'm just if you join a club you should feel like you should be allowed to keep going and be a part of it as much as everyone else. You? Yeah, well, I think the trend is now for parents to put their child into one of those nice teams on a Sunday, so they think that they're getting that um, experience. Experience, thank you. Um, but then on a Saturday, it's like, right, this is the elite level. We're going to play for this club, um, or try this club. We're going to get in there, and then. If that's not working out, they'll just move to another elite team and another one, another one, because there's so many of them now. Um, but what's happening, like you said, the byproduct of that is you're getting these kids now that are maybe not doing that, not involved in Saturday football or, or in elite leagues, and um, they're beginning to think that they're not good enough or being left out. Um, and we're losing kids to the game. And it's yeah, sad. I, I think there's a bit of ownership for the parents as well. If they're turning if they're looking the other way at a child that's not being taken to the next elite team with their child how soon is it going to be till that is your child that's left out and feeling that way and yeah. why is it okay because it's not your child it's it's really really difficult one um, I can imagine say England Boxing Federation or <laughs> such like set up in our local area um, and my lad wants to go or some of his friends do um, I might say we'll stay at your club there because we're loyal to them but we'll go and train with this new super club because they're England um, affiliated and they've had you know Ricky Hatton come down and say some nice things or whatever it might be I can't put my hand on my heart and say that I wouldn't take him along to have a look either now if I was um from a boxing background and stuff, then I might know better um, if I'd studied it and stuff, but I, I don't, so I'm quite likely to, and I think that's where the problem lies, isn't it? You see these things and you you think, not that the grass is greener, but you might think it might be beneficial for your child, and that's natural, so you go and have a look and, and, and take them along, and actually, I just want to make people aware that it might not be the best thing for your child. As soon as you're aware, you realise that there might be alternatives and you can start thinking and as soon as you're thinking you might make better choices that's it that's my job in a nutshell Jeff I, don't I feel even... I feel like I've been in a boxing ring with these questions <laughs> um, it's been full on hasn't it yeah was that question number five I think so. only question five oh crikey well um, we'll try and do at least a couple more anyway and then uh, I need to go for a lie down I think Fair enough. Right, who's asking who? Uh, I don't mind asking again. Oh, this one's going to get deep as well. I can see it coming. Question number six, is that right? Yeah, go on, mate. Our son's under-11s manager continually coaches the team throughout the match. I understand that the children need some guidance, but he talks them through every play and every situation. It's got the team quite well organised, but none of the players take risks or express themselves. Other parents seem to love it as results are good but I get very frustrated with it 
Am I right to think that their creativity is being coached out of them or should I accept that this is how managers operate and get on with it? Great question. Long question. Long question, but a great one. And I love the fact that it's long because it means that they've thought about it. Um, They've looked at it from both sides of it and they're not just going along with it. And they're thinking outside the box, if you like, that this actually might be ruining my child or stifling my child's creativity. Um, And my opinion is you are correct. This type of coaching, if it's constant and continuous and every decision is being talked through and the children are being told what to do, when to do, how to do it and at what times, how to react, then there is no room for creativity, no room for making terrible decisions and unfortunately to make good decisions and natural and reactive decisions um, you have to make a load of terrible ones but that's what kids football should be about kids trying things making mistakes and then the best coaches are the ones that then guide them from those mistakes if the child hasn't learned by themselves from those mistakes which often they do by the way so you can just point them in the right direction or if your team's making lots of mistakes as a coach, you then think, well, I know what I'm going to do in my next training session now. I'm going to help them all together as a group. Oftentimes, trying to coach and improve players and a team, the actual match is not the best time to do it. Training. It's called training and practice for a reason. It's because that's where you practice things and you, you train um, and you, you develop. And some of these managers think that they have to be in control of everything don't they Jeff Um, every situation they talk through it's a bit like Tourette's with some of them Um, you know pop it off where could you be now you know um, pass it you know look inside whatever it might be Um, play it safe keep it simple Pez you're making me cringe I hate it (laughs) um, it. switch look on left wing um, Jonty's on, Jonty's on, cross, shoot, <laughs> anything. It's it's endless. And if your manager's doing that, um, your coach, and even the parents on the sideline, it is not an environment or an atmosphere that's conducive to your child fulfilling their potential. Um, I tell you what, all that's going to happen with a manager like that is the kids are going to end up being clones of that manager. Um, and I don't care if that manages, even if it's Ronaldo, you still want your kids to have a chance to be better than that coach. And I guarantee you that the manager isn't of that level. And you want to give these kids half a chance of fulfilling their potential and being better than the manager. And if these kids are only ever doing and only ever playing um, what a manager, an adult, sees is the right thing to do, then they're, they're just... They're just not. They are not going to fulfil their own potential. Um, I wrote in the book, I'm going to bring up the book again, Jeff, um, about a time when I got sucked into this. Um, don't want to spoil the book. But um, I took a team. It was a new team. I had some new players in there. I think they were probably year sixes, something like that. I wanted to impress the parents. I felt under pressure. I arrived in my van with Pezza Street Soccer and proudly supported by Southampton Football Club and Southampton Football Club badge all over my van people going oh look the professionals are here and all this kind of stuff I felt under pressure to win and I tried to pick the best team in the best positions and I taught them through everything Um, and we had a lad playing for us I'm going to name him because he's old enough now Rhys Sullivan his dad was a friend of mine Dan Sullivan and he was given the ball on the wing and he had his back to goal and his player marking him and I said to him pop it off and he didn't and I said pop it off play it simple or play it safe or play the way you're facing or whatever jargon I might have used typical manager stuff and he did a Cruyff turn so he ignored me he did a Cruyff turn to get round the player that was marking him too tightly ran down the wing with the ball crossed it in and we scored And I just thought, wow, if that kid hadn't ignored me, if he'd have done what I did, we'd have 
kept the ball, you know, recycled it and all that. I'd have felt, I've done my job, but I'd never have seen that from that kid, that moment of magic, which it was. It was a really good moment of magic. And to be fair, Reese went on and got signed at a pro club not long after that. He went to Swindon for a while. Um, and he might not have done if he'd have listened to dinosaurs like me at the time saying, do this, do that, you know. You, if a manager's going to do it, they're best off saying things like, scan, get your head up, what can you see, that type of thing. So you're guiding them to make their own decisions. Because I tell you now, there'll be children in, what was it, under 11s, there'll be children in that under 11s team that you're talking about with this question. There'll be children that are better or have more potential and see the game differently than the manager that's telling them how to see the game, for sure. And all that'll happen is they'll end up being clones of that person and and only ever being as good as them and you want at least to give them a chance of being better than them can't go deep again jeff can't help it again it's something you're really passionate about i was yeah. stood behind you that day when you shouted oh were you there jeff pop it off i didn't realize and i gotta say i reckon that was the first time i'd ever seen somebody in a coaching role hold their hands up straight away and say oh, i got that completely wrong yeah and it was a very powerful thing for me to see because I was only early 20s at the spectrum, mid-20s at yeah, the time. Yeah. And I I would never have... I probably yeah, would never have seen that did in, come to watch in that, my didn't whole you? life. You it was did down come to watch, yes. Southampton way somewhere, I think. Yes. Um, so, yeah, I, I found that a big thing because it just showed me what an open-minded coach you are because if, if something isn't right, you change it. And it's... Um, it's well, very easy to think I know everything I've read these books or I've done this coaching course isn't it Once I've worked once, at a pro club once you started coaching and not be able to say oh, I got that completely wrong today um, and I'm not going to show those behaviours ever again or something well and I, I'm going to go as far as it changed my life yeah yeah well, I probably did mine too then yeah probably did because mm. I suddenly realised a lot and that I had to look at how I did things and became even more studious shall I say and looked at different ways of doing things and the psychology behind things and probably if it wasn't for Reese and that moment um, might not even be doing this podcast so powerful moments why I pass it on in the book and I've passed it on here I've probably mentioned it before on the podcast I've been doing it a while now but it is a powerful message um, I think he plays in goal now, by the way. Yeah, he does. <laughs> He's not doing Cruyff turns. And goes, well, then maybe he is. But it does go to to show that you need to be very comfortable on the ball to play at a decent level in goal. Um, I get it, though, with these managers. Some of it's nervousness. I used to get really nervous. Um, pressure from the parents. want them to know that I know what I'm on about. So... You'd stand there and you'd say all of the jargon and all of the things. Um, so that's one side of it. It might be nerves. And once you start, you tend to become a commentator and you can't stop. Um, it's very difficult, especially if you're on your own and you haven't got an assistant to bounce ideas off or to, to check your behaviour, if you like. Um, can be a bit of ego. It can be a bit, I'm going to talk my players through everything that's going on and every move. Because then if they lose, it's not my fault. The parents can see that I've done everything. The kids know that I've done everything. I'm happy that I've done everything possible during that period of play to make sure that those kids didn't lose. So it's kids' fault, not mine. So a bit of ego can come in and a bit of a, a safety net. Because a lot of managers are under pressure now, especially if they're in elite leagues. They have to win games of football or they'll lose kids. So there is a bit of a rat race going on for managers to get their children to play like mini adults really really quickly but for kids to play at a high level and uh, when they are adults they have to play like kids because they are kids and it's a different game to the adult game and it's not a rush to get it looking like adult football they're kids kids play like kids they make childish decisions and then they learn from them um and managing, managing and coaching should be about guidance, not dictatorship. I'm coming out of it today, Jeff. Yeah, you are. I am absolutely spewing it out. From this 
parent asking should they accept? <laughs> I forgot even coach, what the question was. A coach I forgot even side. what my notes were, Jeff. <laughs> um, it's good though, isn't it? It is good. I, I mean, I wrote here that you're actually coaching. If you're doing that, then the manager's coaching them to be average. And it goes back to what I say. They're just coaching them to be to make all the same decisions. They make the same decisions as each other and the same decisions that that manager would make in that um, position. What you want to be doing is encouraging these children to make their own decisions, rightly or wrongly. And then that's your, your starting point for for what you're going to coach, depending on the individual and the scenario. Um, I've written, we call these managers PlayStation managers, because there is a chapter in the book called PlayStation managers. I think it's actually avoid PlayStation managers. Um, so I've thrown that in there and, you know, they like being in control of everything. Um, but what it does do is it creates, and this is the big, the big kicker, um, they create a fear of making mistakes so players don't try things. So if you've got a manager that constantly shouts out and tells you things, you're not going to try anything different. One, you might not want to go against the coach. One, you might think it's unacceptable to go against the coach because they're the boss. Um, and two, you might fear getting told off. So you've got a bunch of kids now, well organised, but they're terrified of trying anything because they give the ball away or things might not work out and the manager or the parents or both w won't like it. And so you've got this um, mistake-free culture that's drifted into football coaching. Um, and unfortunately, it's mistakes and failure and trying things and experimenting and pushing the boundaries and, and children exploring what they're capable of and what they're not capable of at that particular time. It's those things, um, trial and error, that will help a child fulfil their potential. So managers that shout out Jeff all the time are actually taking away those learning opportunities. But I get it, they're under pressure, they've got to win. Because if they don't, the two kids that they like or their best player will be playing for their rivals down the road in a couple of weeks or at the end of the season or whatever it might be. And they'll be getting phone calls from parents saying, oh, we didn't win today because of this, that and the other. And it's a mess, Jeff, if I'm honest. It's, it's a bit of a mess. Yeah, so... What can, we do, what can we do about it other than waffling about it on a podcast? Well, I, we can educate, yeah. which is why we do the podcast and why I've written a book. I can educate parents, which might help take the pressure off managers. Hopefully coaches will listen to this and the book or hopefully even work it out for themselves at some point. Yeah, the, the key know. bits I've underlined are none of the players take risks or express themselves and then should I accept this? Um, and I suppose, no, you shouldn't accept it because... None of the players are expressing themselves or taking any risks or, or getting much learning done in the game environment. And It's a funny old environment, the match day environment, isn't it? And I don't know how many coaching courses actually talk about it or explain the the pitfalls of well, what you've talked If anyone would know, about. you would, because you've done them all. Yeah. You did all the youth modules. But quite a long time ago, some of yeah, the courses and things. So, um, what... The, the match day environment, I suppose one good thing is you don't have loads of parents behind the goalkeeper shouting at the goalkeeper. That used to be a thing, didn't it? That it still happens, Jeff. Well, it did when the, I was running my last team, what, five years the, Well, ago, there should be a respect so. barrier on one side of the pitch and the coaches and the players on the other side of the pitch. But even that's quite a funny thing because you feel like the coach feels like they've got to perform to those parents, I expect, to some degree. If you're looking at it from the coach's point of view, that's probably under pressure to look like they know what they're talking about. Like, like you explained earlier. I don't know if there's something you can do with the match day environment to make it more relaxed, I guess. And well, like you say, they have... Conducive to expressing yourself. They have uh, the FA of you know, release guidance and they do have the FA barriers that you have to stay behind. Um, they have, I think they used to call it silent Sundays. Um, now with so much Saturday football, I don't know if they call it silent weekends, but it um, doesn't have quite the ring to it where... Everyone has to be silent, the parents and the coaches, and let the kids play. And I love the idea with that, but it's only one week. And it's, you know, 
I'd like to see that. I've not, I don't think I've ever been to a silent cemetery. I haven't either, and perhaps we should, Jeff. Really. And I bet it's quite eerie and quite strange. And yeah, I, I feel sorry for the really good guys that are out there, that are, are coaching really, really well during the game and making real key coaching points, um, and encouraging the children to make mistakes and to, you know, get your head up and what can you see and. You know, you've seen it, play it, don't be scared. And, you know, all the right things that you can say, all the good psychology, you're taking that away on a silent weekend as well. Um, because, unfortunately, the negatives are outweighing the positive ones at the moment. So getting that balance right, I don't know. I mean, that, you know, the following weekend, they're all back to shouting instructions and shouting things out and whatnot anyway. So you really are just putting a plaster over something um, but it's a start I guess and it's better than nothing but again it's, it's educating everyone involved and you can only do that through courses and courses take time and money and effort um, so representatives should go around you should have league meetings and I suppose they do and I expect these things are talked about nowadays um, but are ignored I know you have um, they were just bringing them in when I was still managing teams where you have, um, oh, I can't remember the term, but they used to wear like a high-vis jacket and they would be the, the person that would then speak to someone down Apparent there. Apparent liaison officer. Something along thing, those yeah. lines, yeah. And, and really, really good strides forward. But with these elite leagues and stuff going on now, and it's become ultra-competitive, miles before it should do. I mean, get competitive when children are in secondary school ages, but sort of under sevens to under elevens it's become ultra competitive um and this stuff is a natural byproduct of it because people want to win just wonder is there something you could do with that match day environment like give everyone a chair so they sat down rather than stood up i don't yeah, know yeah facing the wrong way <laughs> <laughs> the psychology of, <laughs> of of a crowd being stood in a line watching a game of football just something must happen mustn't it that the coach feels like they've got to perform in front of that crowd and I think sometimes even the parents start shouting out and the coach thinks well if they're shouting out I've got to shout louder than them to yeah and, and sometimes and I've been there when um, parents are shouting out things that you really don't want them to do yeah so then you start shouting out things that you want them to do or you know and you can't shout out just ignore your mum yeah. so you have to then be clever and, and shout other things and it's it's, um, it's a bit of a minefield and you know, I didn't enjoy it towards the end. You know, I didn't enjoy tournaments. We turn up at a tournament and there would be um, parents all around the pitch, not just with a respect barrier, because the pitches would be next to each other. Yeah, so you'd yeah. have, you know, so there'd be a, a lot of people there. So then some people would go around to the other side. You'd have people behind the goal mouse coaching the, the keepers for like an eight to ten minute match at best. Um, Lots of shouting out, lots of over celebrating. I, you know, the whole environment, I, I didn't really enjoy as a manager or as coach at the end. I felt very much under pressure um, to win, and I had to be so brave, Jeff, to be quiet on the sidelines and let my kids make mistakes. But again, I had to educate the parents and say, well, this is my style. This is what I do. I like kids to express themselves, make mistakes, try things. Um, and if they keep making the same mistake, then I'll guide them and I'll work on them in training if I have to. Or I've, I used to pull kids over during a match. I used to pull over and, and individually. And parents didn't like it because then we were a player down for however long it would take me to explain something to them. But See, that's the great thing about futsal is you're just constantly rolling... I can yeah, take can make those points. I think you can do that in grassroots football now. Anyway, can't you? You can roll. On yeah, there's subs. there's still a little bit of um, a stigma about being brought off as a sub, though, isn't there? So they think they're being right. punished as a child. You've done something wrong. Let's go and talk about it. So I used to go right. Oh, I'm just going to do it during the game, um, and not replace them, and then just get my coaching point over. Well, spend hours yeah, yeah. but I would say something like you know oh, you've done this twice now um, what do you think you could do and you know you get them to come up with the answers uh, depending on what it might be 
and I remember one lad he played for me, I won't name him, you, you know him very well, um, tried taking the ball off the goalkeeper twice and taking it round the player at the back um, when he was under pressure and being pressed and he gave the ball away twice on the trot and we conceded twice. And then the next time the goalkeeper got the ball, I was shouting, give it to him, give it to him. And everyone thought I was crazy because I wanted to, him to be put under pressure and learn and actually he worked out for himself. He made a better yard of space for himself and then popped it off to someone. Bang, job done. Worked it out for himself. You know, you um, you don't always have to talk them through every single thing. God, this has been a right old marathon, hasn't it? What well, we are, we're on an hour and fifteen. We've done six questions, and I'm tempted to say, shall we leave it there and leave these to roll over to the next one, Jeff? Yeah, I think that's a good um, shout, boss. The next one is the next question is about what to do if your child suddenly decides they want to stop playing football. Um, and this has happened to me. My child's done it recently. Stopped playing football and then played futsal with you, Jeff. So we're both invested in the next question. And then suddenly decided, he's now coming up to 14, that he wants to quit playing football, futsal altogether um, and concentrate on his boxing. Um, so I've been there. And I'm, as you know, a football fanatic and attached to it and attached to him obviously and it's quite a, a big deal to swallow i think that's mixing up two phrases there and one but i'm good at that <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah so i think after this being such a heavy one we'll do that one because we're very invested in the answer yeah, yeah. that one much more we'll give it much more um i don't even know what the word i'm looking for and in the meantime i can go to his boxing gym <laughs> punch him in the face till he comes back to football yeah, so is this really what you want <laughs> come back <laughs> come back that'll make but him no, want to come back wouldn't yeah, it <laughs> which, yeah you're an absolute heavyweight no offence but um, but yeah we're, justice as well we'll do it much more justice when it's um, when Betsy's back and the, the three of us are, are together so cool this has been the inner huddle I'm Pez and this is Jeff, and we have been sponsored by SR Health Safety and Engineering Limited. And I really hope you've enjoyed it. And as I always say, football's not that important, but children are. We'll see you next time.